Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Think Tank Birmingham for the March meeting of Newcomer Midlands. And welcome to those of you at home watching on remotely on Zoom. Uh, we have this evening got Dr. Tom Elliott to talk to us. Um, he's going to talk to us about sulfuric acid, cement and detergent products from anhydrite by the Mueller-Kuhner process. Dr. Elliott has given a number of lectures to us. I think this is the sixth he's given since, uh, I think 1999 was the first one. Um, he is a mining engineer and his uh, involvement with the anhydrite was uh, as manager of the, of the mine uh, uh, and of Solway Chemicals, which was part of Albright and Wilson. Um, and it produced sulfuric acid and cement at the plant. Um, and I'm sure he will tell us all about it. But uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Elliot to uh, come and tell us about it. Well, good evening, everybody, uh, both uh, here and in spirit. Uh, uh, this is a welcome opportunity for me uh, to give this presentation to the Newcomen Society. Uh, particularly, it's uh, unfortunate that we have these times uh, with the events happening in, in the Ukraine. Uh, but Birmingham is an appropriate venue to talk about some very acid. <clears throat> Uh, Royal Book's uh, lead chamber process uh, was one of the first uh, mass-produced methods of producing sulfuric acid here in Birmingham in uh, 1746. And uh, would you believe there was a, a plant also in Bewdley, of all places, uh, run by uh, Mr. Skye, who uh, eventually built the house where the safari park is now. So anyway, the advance of the chemical industry is such that uh, there are perpetual innovations, perpetual advances uh, leading to uh, redundancy of plant development of new plants, and also external influences such as ex uh, war, wars, uh, commercial dictates, uh, and political influences of where political power lies at any one time to influence this the location of plants and their raw materials. This story uh, I'm, I'm about to relate is not only technical, uh, but also remarkable. It was, the relate, uh, it was to relate how uh, an industry, a, chemical, a sizable chemical industry was uh, uh, established in West Cumbria, uh, just after the war. Uh, and, uh, uh, quite a few innovations took place, and it was quite an influential industry. The main person behind all this was, was uh, a gentleman by the name of Frank Shaw, who was an Austrian refugee who had managed to escape to England uh, a few days before uh, the, the Hitler invaded the southern Czechoslovakia. Uh, Sean was a chemist and uh, wanted to immediately uh, Establish a chemical industry in the UK. First of all, in London, where he made a brave attempt at, uh, at, a, at a business, uh, but unfortunately got bombed out very quickly. And for some reason, he chose Whitehaven as a place to start his business. Uh, I'm uh, quite uh, uh, pleased to be doing this tonight because uh, I invested in 20 years of my managerial career in being involved in, in the events at my team. Uh, the scope of my talk tonight will cover its earlier development, the, the actual origins of the process of, of making sulfuric acid and cement from uh, anhydrite, and uh, how to operate the plant, all its trials and tribulations, and uh, various uh, aspects of, of the operation.
Here we see Frank Sean and his early collaborators. Uh, he was a 30 year old Austrian, uh, had some chemical experience, uh, but uh, starting from scratch at Whitehaven, uh, uh, one of the first sites he managed to get hold of was a, a former colliery site, which, which had coke ovens and tanks of, of uh, coke, pro coke products such as naphtha. So he established, uh, established a fire lighting business. And in fact, he was the main supplier to the co-op at that time. And uh, it was very successful. But on that, he built up a successful chemical industry moving to, uh, uh, to other products. Uh, um, uh, just like Hitchcock, uh, one has to appear in one's own uh, productions. Here's me showing the uh, original uh, mass-produced products that, that eventually made the Marsh on site. At, uh, it's called Marsh on eventually, by the way, to, to, uh, to combine the names of Sean, and his, his uh, managerial assistant, Fred Marzulia. Ah, uh, eventually it became quite a, a well-known name in the, in the household uh, chemical business. Uh, here, here you can see one of the trade stands, I think this was a girl's court, uh, making uh, what was novel at that time, washing powder. That there wasn't the advent of washing machines and household gadgets that we have today. But uh, Sean uh, quickly got a, a, an arrangement with Colgate of America to make their uh, uh, washing powder for machines called Fab, which uh, made the business grow quite rapidly. And uh, here is a, a list of the products and uh, raw materials as the site became 10 years old. Quite a, an overall uh, range of products. Uh, and eventually it ran to a thousand products made from 400 different raw materials, which is considerable. Eventually, though, it outgrew the uh, the uh, the original size, and uh, it, having to import all raw materials uh, obviously wasn't going to lead anywhere. And uh, one of the one of the uh, chemicals that's needed to make uh, to make uh, further advance was was sulfuric acid, which had to, uh, as an intermediate phosphoric acid which uh, led to producing the main ingredient for washing powders, which was sodium tripolyphosphate. Uh, but having imported all these materials, he had to find a way of uh, making it on site. Now, the... Uh, the, the time that this happened was, was early 1950s when uh, the Korean War was on and the methods for making sulfuric acid were quite limited. Uh, sulfur was embargoed by the government. There wasn't allowed, only uh, existing uh, imports would be allowed. Uh, the Americans, which was the big source from Texas, they were allowed to be exported anyway. And uh, so he had to look around to find out uh, how he could make sulfuric acid. <coughs> um, the, someone tipped him off, though, that uh, there was a, 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 a plant at Billingham. In, uh, on Billingham on Tees, run, which had run from, uh, since the 1930s by ICI. So he thought, uh, Sean thought, well, how can I uh, get the know how for that? And ICI wouldn't sell it to him, uh, or, or it's too expensive. Um, he also found out that there was a, a, another plant operating in Linz in, in Austria, in the place of his birth. 
So he went over to Linz and uh, he put an advert in local papers, actually. This is the sort of expedient Sean would go to. Uh, advertising for te technicians who knew about the anhydrite process. And who should turn up but Mr. Muller, the, uh, the, the, the actual one of the originators of the process. And he put him in touch with Mr. Kuna, who'd uh, recently been uh, tried for war crimes when running the IG farming uh, uh, chemical factory with slave labor in Germany, but been exonerated. And, and uh, he eventually uh, agreed to co co collaborate with Sean in, in establishing an anhydrite plant at Whitehaven. Uh, well, what is anhydrite? Uh, anhydrite is uh, one of an evaporite. Uh, class of mineral, uh, which owes its origins from the evaporation of sea of salt water. Uh, but when you see the, the anhydrite seams at Whitehaven, which uh, vary between 15 and 45 feet thick, it would take hundreds of years of evaporation of salt water to produce solidified uh, uh, rock uh, of, uh, of that uh, nature. The other well-known evaporites, of course, are rock salt, potash, and, hay, and uh, the, the uh, other ingredients that uh, go into fertilizers. Of course, there is the deep mine at Bulby in, in the, on the northeast coast. But anyway, the anhydrite process uh, uh, relied on uh, knowing what what uh, what it was and where to get it from. Well, as it happens, one of the friends of, of Sean at that time was a chap called Jack Adams. Uh, he eventually became Lord Adams of Enerdale, an ex-iron uh, ore miner who, who was very uh, up in local politics. But he'd seen recently where British gypsum and the Bestrad Iron Company had been drilling for uh, gypsum uh, in, in, on St. B's Head, which is uh, near, near, near the nearest place to Whitehead. In so doing, they encountered vast quantities of anhydrite, which was the stroke of luck that uh, Sean wanted. So he, uh, he set about uh, establishing an anhydrite process to make sulfuric acid uh, in, in, uh, around about 1952 when this decision was made. The geologically, for the geologist's uh, interest, uh, West Cumbria is quite uh, uh, quite a feature with, with evaporite deposits. That top side there is, is a, a borehole on, on St. B's head. The black part, the darker part, is the uh, lower Pervo Trias, where the uh, evaporites, which are anhydrite and gypsum, uh, lie. About 30 miles to the east, British ships have had an establishment uh, in the Eden Valley, which, which capitalised on the gypsum part. Uh, but it, it, the, the basin that, that it forms in goes out to the west, it becomes anhydrite, which is calcium, the anhydrous form of calcium sulfate. This is uh, what this lump of, uh, of rock to my left is, uh, if you can show it. Uh, It's very rare to see a lump of anhydrite because none of it is mined today, except by accident. And uh, this is the uh, the rock that uh, that uh, was mined eventually to, to make uh, the sulfuric acid. Uh, there's a, a, a museum sample. In fact, the, the top left one does come from the, the anhydrite mine at the white age. And uh, there we are. This, this is the same shot as that I took at home of the the, the rock. You see, <clears throat> it's about a piece of rock like that is about 94, 95 percent calcium sulfate. The only the rest of the ingredient, the uh, composition, will be iron and uh, bits of dolomite, 
and stay sort of carbonate, uh, both calcium and uh, magnesium carbonate. And magnesium oxide, uh, which I'll mention later on because that was one of the uh, causes, one of the problems in the process. Uh, I've uh, li listed the uh, characteristics and all that, but it's important to know particularly the specific gravity, which is of nearly three, and uh, the, uh, the hardness of the rock. It's a very hard rock, as hard as some of the granites that appear in the UK, United Kingdom. Uh, this is measured on a thing called the Mohs scale, and uh, anhydrite is about 3.5 on the Mohs scale. Uh, I jump now that to the acid tank. We, we eventually, uh, uh, Sean and his colleagues did uh, build a plant at Whitehaven based with the help of Hans Kuhner. And uh, eventually, uh, it, it, it built, it built uh, uh, two, two plants in the beginning, a third one uh, uh, sometime later. And I, I took a pair of them again in 1968 and followed that timeline, each time increasing the capacity for sulfuric acid to, for use at the right hand side. We move now to the, the events that uh, the, the mine, uh, the anhydrite mine, if, if you know the uh, coast to coast walk. Uh, the western end of it, the main right wall, is, is actually on St. B's head, almost immediately by the mine entrance as to where the mine used to be. Uh, this is the scene in uh, 1954 when it opened, when the, the mine manager at that time, who was my predecessor eventually, uh, is accompanying the Duke of Edinburgh uh, on a trip down the mine. Notice the Duke's polished shoes there, I don't know how they allowed him to, to do that. Uh, underground, a few shots uh, out of interest uh, because very few people uh, uh, have actually know, know what it's like uh, to be a, work, working underground. Uh, I was a mining engineer with the National Coal Board before I went there, and a lot of the technology of mining was new to me as well. There you see a, a drill rig drilling the ball holes to, to, to ena enable blasting the rock uh, before it was prepared. And the, not, not only anhydrite was mined, the occurring above the anhydrite was, was a geological formation called the Sabiz Shale, which had gypsum bands in it. You see the gypsum right there. And, uh, Shale was needed to be mixed with anhydrite uh, and other ingredients to make an acceptable uh, feed to the, to the kilns, which you'll see later on, which to produce an acceptable, uh, uh, acceptable composition of the cement. Uh, normally, cement is made from calcium carbonate in a very straightforward process. Uh, to make cement from anhydrite is a very, very difficult process to, to control and manage, as you'll see later. There's the rock being loaded in uh, front end loader shovels into, uh, into tractors. And here's the tractor. Uh, uh, we had a lot of innovations at the mine. In fact, I developed this design of tractor from a, uh, a Heathrow uh, airport towing tractor at the time. It had, it had to have a, uh, a different uh, mechanical components, like the, the thing on the right is a, an air diffuser, so that the air actually uh, mixed with the, the flowing air of the, the ventilation of the mine, and uh, so it didn't poison the driver. <laughs> and uh, it also had a, a filter uh, to, to, to uh, cope with the dust, to stop it going in the engine. And they also had ball tires, because uh, they found that they lasted a lot longer and uh, the, the smooth tire without tread uh, didn't uh, 
degrades fast, as fast as the treaded tyres because of the roughness of the surface it's on. And uh, here's a complex that was designed within the mine uh, of how two seams of anhydrite, the upper and lower seam, could receive rock into an underground crusher, which would crush the rock from about a metre cube down to two inches in one go. This uh, relied on the uh, characteristics of the rock, its hardness and, and brittleness, uh, and could be handled in an American uh, design crusher called the Kennedy Cuba. And there were three of those underground. And here's the anhydrite rock leaving the crusher to go on its way to the surface. And uh, when it got to the surface, it, it became part of the, uh, uh, the process, which involved a kiln uh, making the, the gas for the, the later process and the, an acid plant, which would treat that gas to make it into sulfuric acid. That you'll see these stages later on. First uh, stage was pre-treatment and here is uh, one of the mine's loaders, it's called a Wagner scoop tram uh, with an eight cubic yard bucket, feeding uh, anhydrite rock into the surface treatment plant which included bore mills and mixing shank uh, weighing mixing devices to put in the other ingredients for shale, coke and sand. And there is the complex of conveyors and dryers, because the shale originally came out of a quarry which, which had about 15% moisture. And uh, in fact, that was the reason we turned over to underground mining of the shale, which only had one or 2%. Uh, before it went through into the kilns, though, it went to uh, one of the problems with consistency of the feed. The rock has natural variations in it, and uh, also that you get plant stoppages and the like to cause disruptions. So we adopted around about 1967 a stockpile blender arrangement uh, whereby two stockpiles were created. One was formed whilst the other one was being withdrawn from into the kiln feed. And uh, that way we hope to smooth out the variations. This was a, 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 a very expensive uh, arrangement, uh, a license from a firm called MIAG, M I A G, Germany, uh, which laid out the, the rock in layers. Actually, what's not shown there is the overhead conveyor. It was a shuttle conveyor which went back and forth, laying out the layers of rock. Then it was reclaimed across the stockpile by a rate reclaimer before it went out to the kilns. That's an aerial, a, a colour shot of the, uh, what's later, I haven't got any photographs of the original equipment, <coughs> but this is what's used nowadays in the cement industry. Uh, manufactured by a German firm called Schmidt. Uh, then the next stage was to mill the material. Uh, bear in mind uh, at the maximum output, uh, 18,000 tons of, of material were being produced from the mine <laughs> and from the, the uh, imported shale and uh, uh, imported coke and sand. And all this had to be milled into what amounts of dust. Which, which was, a, it was called meal because it flowed like a, a liquid. And uh, the, the, ball, the three ball mills, uh, uh, the Edgar Allan ball mills, I think, made in Sheffield. Uh, you only had to have the slightest leak, you see there, to cause a dust problem. And we had perpetual complaint from the local farmers about, uh, about dust affecting their, <laughs> their crops and their, uh, that's the the uh, raw materials with the black shed there was the original anhydrite store before the, the blender was built you'll recognize this countryside shot later on when i did right at the end of the tunnel and the ingredients of anhydrite uh, 
uh, the process was uh, 1.7 parts of anhydrite mixed with coke, shale, and sand. I think the coke's 3%. Uh, uh, made a, a ton of acid and a ton of cement, and the 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 chemistry of cement is quite complex. Uh, when the, when the rock is roasted at a very high temperature, you know, thinking fifteen hundred degrees centigrade, uh, it forms various uh, sulfates, uh, sulfides, and uh, gives off heat and uh, further heat and uh, it, it eventually forms a, a, an acceptable cement OPC or, or an important cement formulation. This is a slide of the kiln uh, which the, the uh, meal is, is put in at the, the top left hand end. Uh, Originally, it was in the form of nodules, which, which, which were done with, with so-called balling pans. Uh, this, this, uh, this technique either went or came, depending on how, how we felt like at the plant, what was being successful. Often we did without it. But mainly it was to prevent the, the gas flow blowing the, the, uh, the, the very fine meal back out of the kiln. So the kiln went in at, uh, they were fired by heavy oil. They, they were fired by coal originally, because the coal mills kept exploding. So the, the, uh, you know, the polarized fuel. So they, they switched over to EHFO, heavy fuel oil, which is uh, how they were throughout my tenure there. And uh, they fired up these brick line kilns, which were 230 feet long lined with the uh, magnesia refractory with mixing uh, bridges in the kilns to, to thoroughly mix the, uh, and they used to rotate at the rate of one rev a minute. And uh, eventually the, the, the uh, anhydrite would give off sulfur dioxide and uh, the, the cement clinker would form out as balls coming down that chute underneath uh, and then get, get cooled as well to be collected uh, into a conventional cement uh, grinding operation. But that's, uh, these are two of the, well, one of the kilns, uh, in fact, unfortunately, a lot of the photographs we've got were we doing with the plant being demolished but uh, nevertheless, they show the operation. That's the, the kiln at the top, and that's the cooler underneath, the clinker cooler. And uh, the, the, there were two plants built like this in 1954, a further one built in 1963, and two more in 1968, making five plants in all, uh, increasing in size as we go along. Uh, that's uh, the kiln shown lengthwise, and the, the beginning of the acid plant is, is the most immediate right building show. Uh, the construction of the kilns can be seen, uh, sadly, it's, it's from a, a shop taken during demolition of the plant. The, the, the actual shell of the kiln is one and a quarter inch boilerplate. And, uh, only specialist uh, metal firms could actually deal with the rolling of it to replace sections of it. And you can see the refractory uh, uh, that's, that's fallen into the, the bottom of the kiln there as well. The, one of the problems was when the, the, these plants run seven days a week, 365 days a year, they had to have certain downtime. But when that happened, the kiln took about four days to cool down, and there was always a race to get the uh, the, the bricklayers <laughs> working in cool enough conditions to go and repair the brickwork inside the kiln. Uh, one thing that, uh, that, that happened that at the time of establishment of Sean's plant, first plant in '54, it was the only cement plant in the north of England. The nearest ones in that region was Hull. And uh, 
So uh, John Lane for, for Carlisle, who were building the M6 at the time, and all part of the M6. Most of that part of the M6 is built from Whitehaven cement. And one of the characteristics of Whitehaven cement, you see it in bridge after bridge up along the, uh, the M6, or its whiteness is very attractive uh, outward appearance. And uh, the people at Whitehaven couldn't understand why John Lane didn't make a that's a selling point in competition with other cement plants which suffered from the starting. If you remember, the, 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 later there was one at Hope in Derbyshire, uh, one over on the Scottish coast, the northeast coast. And uh, but up to that time, my team uh, had, its, had the market to itself. Uh, the, uh, this is a, to move on to the next uh, section. Uh, how the uh, kiln section linked to the acid section. <coughs> the the uh, gas came out of the kiln at a very hot temperature, very dirty, laden with dust, and wet for, with a high moisture content, partly from the, uh, the uh, burning of the oil in the, in the kiln. So that leads on to the uh, section coming on to. Uh, this is uh, when number three uh, stream opened. These uh, streams opened progressively. They're all opened by uh, personality. The first one, by the way, uh, was funded by no less a person than Harold Wilson when he was president of the Board of Trade and funded entirely from government uh, uh, sources by uh, an organization called Data, which is uh, the uh, committee that uh, approves uh, private enterprise uh, uh, private enterprise uh, activities uh, which are funded by government means. Eventually, the the the, the rest of the uh, the uh, the investments were done privately. The gas coming out of the kilns, by the way, between seven and nine percent. We try to get as high as nine percent if possible. But uh, there we see the, the various operations that, that uh, it had to go through. <coughs> the, the process was called the contact process, which had been an acid process since the uh, 1830. But it was only the early 20th century when uh, big plants came on stream. The first being uh, by BASF in Germany. Uh, the inventor was named uh, uh, Mr. Peregrine Phillips. The, uh, the acid plant started by being uh, conditioned by, first of all, electrostatic precipitators. These were 50,000 volt wire uh, machines, which knocked out the dust from the, from the gas stream. Then, uh, there were drying towers, uh, which were literally lead lined towers uh, with water, uh, with, with, uh, with, with strong acid being uh, able to attract the, the uh, water droplets to actually get diluted and become a diluted acid when they came out of the tower. And the heat. Uh, uh, Factor was, was uh, by passing through heat exchanges, which made useful heat for the remainder of the plant. But what I would like to praise here, and I should have done earlier, uh, the kiln operation to, to have a raw meal of a possibly fluctuating quality going into a, a cement kiln called for an absolutely skillful operation. And the, the operators there called kiln burners, who, who were the highest paid people on the plant, uh, who were very skillful at recognizing when to adjust the feed, how to adjust it, whether the clinker was climbing up too high in the kiln or, or whatever. And uh, constantly watching through a, like a welder's shield to, to keep correct operation. Similarly, the, the lead uh, equipment in the plant 
That was all maintained by a group of people called lead burners. This was a skill, uh, I don't know how prevalent it is nowadays in the industry, but uh, again, it was a very valued uh, skill that uh, was recognized in the plant because the, any breakdown of that equipment meant, meant uh, problems with the stoppages. But the, uh, I've got to that again. <laughs> uh, if you see the middle, the middle, uh, just just to the left of the middle east is the blower house. This is the driving force behind the whole plant. This is like a suction arrangement. Uh, I think there's about 200 horsepower in the, the motors that uh, drove that, uh, those suction things, which sucked the gas through from the left, and blew it out through the right. And, uh, the, again, this was a, a, a piece of equipment that had to operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that would blow the gas into a, a vessel called a, a, a contact tower. Now these towers, they, which gave the name to the contact process, were five tier towers with, with trays of, of, of catalysts. In our case, it was vanadium pentoxide catalyst that was used because it was a, a presumed superior performance catalyst, which uh, drew the sulfur dioxide plant in, passed it down, uh, uh, and mixed it with oxygen. And the SO2 plus O2 gave SO3, which is sulfur trioxide, which is an exothermic reaction. So as each stage was passed through, the heat coming out was passed back to the beginning to maintain the, the ingoing temperature of 420 degrees, I think it was, centigrade. And, and all, until it went through all five stages, and hopefully then all the SO2 gas that's come out of that kiln, from that stream, was converted to SO3, sulfur trioxide, which went past from the converter to the right into absorber towers which were contraflowing sulfuric acid at a certain strength, absorbing sulfur trioxide to make stronger sulfuric acid. Uh, as, a, as an operational trick, that 98% sulfuric acid was passed back to the drying stages, which I described earlier with the lead towers, uh, to, to attract the droplets of water to make that uh, a 96 percent acid which is what the ideal acid was to be to be taken off the plant to to uh, go into further processes mainly of which was phosphoric acid then finally there was a stage just below the chimney there uh gas treatment gas tail tail gas treatment because what we had to avoid was gas, that was the 350 foot uh, chimney. <clears throat> Although we we're already 200 feet above sea level on the cliff where the site was. I never knew why we did have to have a red and white uh, uh, paint on the towers, but we did. But uh, the emission from that uh, stack had to be only carbon dioxide and, 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 and uh, steam, well, weak steam uh, because the, the alkali inspector used to keep a close eye on it and if there was any acid mist in the uh, in the uh, exhaust from the plant it, only, it, it didn't have to exceed four grains four grams per, per cubic meter of uh, grains sorry grains not grams and uh, it was quite a thing uh, when we had visits from the alkali inspector which, uh, Going straight to him that from five different plants that they're all performing to to the uh, environmental standards that are expected. The sulfuric acid also we we couldn't sell we couldn't process all the ninety six percent acid. Some of it was sold as oleum. Oleum in its 10, 28, and thirty percent uh, ten, twenty, and twenty eight percent concentrations. Oleum is is sulfuric acid with sulfur trioxide dissolved in it, uh, which is required as, as that chemical to, to make uh, various other formulations uh, in the, in the Mar Marchand products, uh, as it was known then. These are ingredients that went to hair shampoos, toothpaste, 
this sort of thing. All this dangerous chemists doing uh, to make uh, something uh, consumer product. The output, by the way, of the plant started off uh, fairly modestly. Uh, uh, and then gradually increased until the maximum it ever achieved uh, was 7,000 tonnes of acid per week. 95% uh, of which went into make uh, phosphoric acid. The other 5% went into make uh, sulfonation product, products, including the, uh, including the uh, oleum. One final thing, we have one of the few sulfur trioxide liquid plants in, in Britain at, the, at that time. Uh, chemical plants are, uh, are uh, classified by the safety people by a thing called a CIMA certificate, C-I-M-A-H. Uh, a CIMA certificate had to be got if there was significant risk to the public or disaster or something like that. This sulfur trioxide plant, and, and the extreme category. Uh, even a bucket full of this stuff would clear out the town of Whitehaven with, with us in this. So uh, we have quite a lot to, to be safety conscious about. In, uh, in evaluating the risks on these plants, uh, one of the questions was asked, well, what happens if an aeroplane crashes on them? You know, like that. So they have to be taken to extreme Lengths in, in uh, engineering and safety. In fact, the SL3 plant had, had underground tanks uh, which protected from bombs. Even. Well, that's an overhead uh, shot of the uh, kilns four and five acid streams. Uh, the, the acid tank, the, the, the huge tankage of there were three 3,000 tanks with 3,000 tons capacity each. And then there was a whole line of them that you see at the top of 1,000 ton tanks. Uh, occasionally, we'd take one out of the commission, as you see on the right. Uh, this is a photograph I used on the slide, which uh, is one I took and uh, I'm very proud of uh, in 1973, I think. Uh, but eventually, uh, the fuel and labour costs were such, and uh, chemical engineering and technology has advanced so much, and sulphur became available, uh, that uh, the decision was made to uh, run down the anhydrite process and convert it all to sulphur burning. There were supplies of sulphur in southwest France, a place called LAC, L-A-C-Q, and also uh, from Texas. So uh, Albright and Wilson, who, who owned the world by this time, uh, built a, uh, a, a reception terminal at Workington to house, to, to receive 10,000 ton ships of molten sulfur from, mainly from Galveston in Texas. And uh, instead of all, you know, all that dirty uh, anti-hydrite dust and heat and, and wetness, the plant started off with a, with a with a clean molten sulfur ready ready prepared, but the rest of the process is the same. Now, eventually, by 1975, I think uh, I oversaw all this conversion with, with the engineers, and uh, we eventually streamlined the plant. Units one and two were converted into one sulfur burning unit. Number three was abandoned, and numbers four and five individually were, were converted to sulfur burning units. And the combined unit, uh, combined plant at that time, produced 11,000 tons a week of sulfuric acid, probably more reliably than they did from the uh, anhydride process, which made it the biggest sulfuric acid plant in Europe. Which continued, uh, that's a picture of the sulfur burner, that uh, unit at the top of the steps. You, know. you can actually peer into that, uh, the spy hole at the end of the thing and see a beautiful lilac coloured flame of burning sulfur. 
And one or two innovations had taken place meanwhile. We had uh, miles and miles of, of cast iron coolers called hairpin coolers. And uh, developed from the food industry where for cooling milk, you see on the right of that picture, a plate cooler, uh, which would replace miles and miles of, uh, of acid, uh, cast iron coolers. Well, there, unfortunately, we, keep, we come to the end of the, uh, the uh, story behind the anhydride process, uh, because it then becomes a sort of process. And uh, the, the demolition took place because times moved on even further, because sulfuric acid plants were springing up all over the world, and phosphoric acid plants uh, to accompany them. First of all, in places like Morocco, where the phosphate rock uh, uh, raw material came from. And then I gather a lot of those have closed down now. And a lot of them have been replaced by plants in China, I understand. But uh, anyway, we didn't just stand still. We thought, well, we've got an anhydrite mine here with 60 miles of tunnels, uh, fairly dry. And uh, we, have, we have a facility for producing anhydrite. So a gentleman by the name of Gordon Atkinson and myself spent two years studying the, the possibility of using either the mine or the product for, uh, for further use. And we came to a whole list of interesting uh, uh, combinations like whiskey store, uh, for, uh, catalyst leaching ground for the oil industry. Uh, the top of the list was a coal mine. We thought, well, we were, we were into chemicals and uh, we had a chap called Harry Edwards who had a history of chemicals from coal. So we drew up quite a scheme of chemicals from coal and the stumbling block was the coal board. They wouldn't allow us to, to mine coal and price the coal into a chemical plant different to their prices, even, even with open cast coal. So I fell out with the various former colleagues in the coal board about this. And uh, the, the, uh, it, it, the, the idea uh, actually hit tightly death. But uh, it was a very interesting exercise, and we found a lot, a lot about the future uses of anhydride from it, none of which have been taken up not very commercially, but some, some have on a minor way. And that's, uh, well, it comes over quite poorly, a, a, a plan of the mine as it finished uh, up. Uh, it had mined 3 million tonnes of anhydride from 1954 to 1979, uh, I think the last tonnage came out. And it's all, it, the, the plan was to go under, under the Irish Sea, but uh, we never got that far. But all those markings on the plan show you the, the red is the upper sea, but the blue is the lower sea. But uh, lo and behold, uh, in the last three years, uh, oh, uh, uh, here comes uh, the West Cumberland Mining Corporation, who want to do a coal mine on our site. If you remember the, the site that uh, the, showed the raw materials thing, well, that's the same site with the, the new coal company's uh, buildings, as they hope there will be. Unfortunately, they haven't taken on the government inspection uh, inquiry at the moment, having got planning permission three times, and various environmentalists don't want to continue coal mining in this country, but all the coal they were mined, uh, mine was to go to the steel industry to make coking coal. So that's the story. Uh, hopefully it comes full circle. Uh, thank you for being such a patient audience and listening. I'd like to thank Steve Stride for helping with some of the slides. But also former colleagues, Jeff Wake, John Kennedy, uh, uh, contacted recently for the information. But not forgetting past uh, colleagues at the right hand side with whom I had such a good working relationship. So thank you.